It's an honor to have my uh, friend and colleague, Rabbi Jason Weiner, Hi. here, um, out here. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Oh, okay, I, I heard something weird. Um, Rabbi Jason Weiner here, who uh, uh, went to the same rabbinical school that I went to, and he's a top scholar in medical ethics and beyond. And uh, when I lived in LA, got to know him uh, quite well, uh, you know, praying at the synagogue that he was uh, also, uh, that he was a rabbi of. And uh, I'm not going to introduce him. I'm going to leave that to <laughs> Rabbi Nitzan Stein Koken. Um, we're thrilled to have Bethel for the first time, Bethel Congregation, as a uh, partner congregation with Valley Beit Midrash to, to expand Jewish learning throughout the valley. And Oops. Um. Did we just lose Rabbi Shmuley Yankolovich? Yes, I think we did. I'm sure we did. I think we that. did. <laughs> yeah. Well, we at Bethel, we're very excited that we are in this partnership with Valley Beit Midrash, uh, expanding and, you know, reconnecting the communities all together and expanding the learning. Um, and this is, I also had the honor to meet uh, uh, Rabbi Jason Weiner, Dr. Rabbi Jason Weiner in LA briefly though, our paths crossed um, as he was the president or is still the president of uh, right. Board of Rabbi, was right? <laughs> Board of Rabbis. Um, he, he, you are very accomplished. You hold, uh, you, you are not only the senior rabbi and director of special care department at Cedar sinai in Los Angeles, um, where you are responsible for the chaplaincy team. And I believe you're also training quite a number of clergy rabbis and other, from other um, denominations also and religions. Um, you were also yourself a, a pulpit rabbi, a little bit, <laughs> at the uh, Congregation Knesset Israel in Beverly Wood. You hold a doctorate in clinical bioethics from Loyola University. You have a master's degree in bioethics and health policy. You have two smichot, two ordinations, and you've published, and you've published, uh, um, and you are um, a certified rabbi uh, chaplain through Neshama, the Association of Jewish Chaplains. And I see a couple of chaplains here on this um, call also, hospital chaplains. And so we are very excited to have you to talk to us um, about the dilemmas um, that have arisen and the values in Jewish medical, uh, Jewish medical ethics. Um, that that you experience, I guess, firsthand often. I read a little bit in your book, um, some quite some amazing stories you bring. And I want to just um, invite you to share your learning with us. wanted to ask you, are you planning on lecturing and we'll have questions at the end or how would you like to hold it? Sure. Um well, thank you. First of all, thank you very much, Rabbi Stein Koken. It's great to see you again, and to Vibe Midrash for helping to convene this. Really, thank you all. It's quite an honor to be with all of you. Um, so thank you. Um, I, I think I'll, I'll share a few initial thoughts um, to try to frame, and, and then open, we'll keep it open. I have, I could just keep talking for hours probably, but I think um, I'll, I'll just share some thoughts and then hear what feedback, you know, what questions or comments you have or stories that all of you want to share, and then we can just keep on going from there. So um, I'll just give some background. You know, I, I was excited to hear you say that we have some chaplains here on the call, because if people don't always know, you know, what a chaplain does, there's oftentimes a lot of confusion, especially Jewish chaplain. You know, I wear this badge, you know, everywhere I go in the hospital, and it says chaplain on it, really big words. It says rabbi there, small, but chaplain really big. People often, you know, look at me like kind of confused, like, uh, you know, I walk in the room and they say, oh, don't try it on us. We're Jewish. You're not going to convert us. I'm like, no, first of all, I'm, I'm Jewish too. And we're not trying to convert anybody. Um, and, and I'll say like, you know, I'm, I'm the rabbi here. And they'll say, oh, so, you know, are you like you supervise the food in the kitchen or like what? 
they, they don't understand like that there's rabbis who are chaplains who visit patients to support them um, through their healing. And it, it's complicated, it's complicated here um, in every hospital, you know, here at Cedar sinai um, the culture is a little bit, you know, Hollywood. It's an incredible hospital, but we're surrounded by, we're in, we're located in Hollywood. I mean, we're actually, I'm sitting right now on the corner of um, George Burns Drive and Gracie Allen Drive. That's literally the corner that we're on, George Burns and Gracie Allen. Um, you know, I mean, we're in the, there's Steven Spielberg building across the way and our, um, our cafeteria is the Ray Charles cafeteria. Um, the whole hospital is, you know, um, movie stars names. And, um, you know, I always thought it was just kind of cute. I never noticed it really until um, last year, Passover, um, you know, we made a special menu for kosher for Passover menu. And I wanted everyone to know that it's kosher. I mean, I wanted to make sure that and no one would be, you know, uh, concerned. So I wrote on the bottom of the menu, we, we put in bold letters, all food under the strict rabbinic supervision of the Rabbinical Council of California. That's a prominent kosher certification um, organization here. And I thought everyone would know what it is. But what I didn't know is that um, our hospital came up with a new policy that they don't like acronyms. Um, so what, what I had initially written was it didn't fit Rabbinical Council of California. So I just wrote RCC because everyone here knows RCC is Rabbinical Council. So I put all the food under the strict supervision of the RCC. Um, so they don't like acronyms, but no one told me. So when it first got to a patient, I didn't even know until I got a call from a patient like, Rabbi, is this some kind of joke? Is the food kosher here or not? So I said, well, what do you mean? Of course it is. Just come, come see this. I went up to the room. He shows me his menu. <laughs> All food under the strict rabbinic supervision of Ray Charles. They, they had changed the RCC. They thought it meant, you know, Ray Charles and not rabbinical council. So, um, you know, sometimes mistakes happen that way. And, and actually that same day, if you remember, this is the last year Passover was on, a, was on Shabbat. Two, this is two years ago. Um, Passover was on Shabbat. And so normally we have a little Shabbat service right before Shabbat begins in our chapel. We broadcast it live and we have an announcement that goes out on the loudspeaker, you know, Shabbat services beginning in 15 minutes. So, um, but that week we also had a Passover Seder that we were broadcasting. So I thought, you know, it's gonna be too confusing. Passover Seder and Shabbat services. This week we'll just do the Seder. I'm gonna cancel the Shabbat services. So I called the operator and I say, if you don't mind, please just cancel the Shabbat service announcement and just keep the Passover Seder announcement. So they said, okay, no problem. So I'm getting ready to go home. Finally, I did all the damage control from the menus. It's late in the afternoon. An announcement comes out, you know, we have 15,000 employees. This is a big, big building. Announcement comes out overhead to the whole entire hospital. Ladies and gentlemen, can I have your attention, please? This week, Shabbat is canceled. <laughs> oh gosh, it was just one problem after another. But, but <laughs> this is just some examples of the stuff that we have to deal with as chaplains. But um, I want to talk today about um, obviously much more serious things and um, challenging um, ethical dilemmas that arise. And, and I want to do it through stories. That was the plan: was to tell some stories to kind of illustrate some points, but really to build uh, an argument or, or, or a point that I really want to make that's important, a crucial point to discuss when we talk about um, Jewish approaches to um, medical decision-making. And, and that really comes down to the most fundamental question of really what is the value of life in Judaism? What is the main point? What, what, what is our key value? And, and many times you'll hear people say, rabbis, um, scholars will say that Judaism believes that life is of infinite value. Life is of infinite value. You hear that a lot, and I never had any concerns about that. I, was, I always um, accepted that, and indeed, we try to give every human being equal and infinite value. Everyone's created in the image of God. Every human being, Jew or non-Jew, every human being is in the infinite, infinite value Im image of God. And, um, and the truth is, the Torah itself says, v'chai behem, you shall live by them, right? That was the first source I put on the sheet there. And there's even a story in the Talmud. This is if you're following along in the sheet. This is the second source. But if you don't, I'll just explain it. Um, the, the Talmud in Yuma the tractate about uh, Yom Kippur, but also many other things, um, has a story that's actually used frequently today in medical ethics discussions, in Jewish medical ethics. Um, the case is uh, if a, a, a massive wall collapses on Shabbat and people are trapped underneath. So do you think you could dig through the rubble violating Shabbat to try to save life? You could just nod your head or... Um, yeah, I see people nodding their heads. Yes, absolutely, of course. What if you think that the person's probably not alive? Could you then? Yes, even then, even if it's not certain. 
Um, what if you're not even sure there's a person there? Then could you dig through the rubble and violate Shabbat? Yes, even then. In other words, we do everything we can to save life. How about this? The reason the Talmud gives that you could do that is because, well, you'll violate one Shabbat, but then the person could observe many Shabbats. So they'll live, you know, and that's, that's more valuable. Well, what if the person had lost so much blood, for example, that you know that you, you could dig through the rubble and try to save them and comfort them, but they're only going to live a few more hours, just a few more hours. They're not even going to make it another week. How about then? Then could you violate Shabbat to, say, to prolong, their long, prolong their life just for a few hours? Yes, I see heads not again. Yes, the answer is yes. So many commentaries who, who read that piece in the Talmud say, well, you see, you could do anything. It doesn't matter. When it comes to saving life, that's the primary value. And so life is of infinite value. This is what some of the commentaries argue. And the truth is, I'll give you a story to, to try to support that kind of perspective or from that, that worldview. Um, um, I, I got a call once, uh, a very disturbing call. This is, uh, you know, um, I'm sure the chaplains will, um, will uh, relate. Uh, I answer my phone. The person doesn't even say their name. They just, I hear crying on the other, other end of the line. And uh, it was the woman who says, you know, Rabbi, I don't know if you remember me. You performed my father's funeral. And now I have to ask you to do my son's funeral. And she's crying and it's just horrible. What a tragic thing to hear. And so I'm just listening and I say, oh, I'm so sorry to hear. Tell me, tell me what's happening. How can I help? She says, well, well here's what happened. My, my son collapsed yesterday. They brought him to the hospital immediately. He's not at your hospital, but at another hospital. And um, he apparently had a brain aneurysm and there was blood all over his brain. And, and they say he has no chance of making it. And, and they want to withdraw all the life support. And they say he'll die you know, right away as a result. And I just said to them, you know, uh, I'm Jewish and I like to just check with my rabbis before I make decisions like this, life and death decisions. Let me just check with my rabbi, but then I, I'll, I'll call you back. So, and then she says to me, so rabbi, of course, you're not going to make my son. You're not going to prolong his suffering like this. It, 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 the compassionate thing is to let him go, right? You agree, right? You know, she's trying to lead, lead the answer, but I understand she was suffering. And I said, you know, uh, I, I was listening and I'm, I'm really trying to um, be compassionate and be flexible, but this has just happened yesterday. And I, I'm trying to understand more. I wasn't at my hospital, so I wasn't able to go and investigate. And I said, well, it just happened yesterday. I mean, have you gotten a second opinion yet? Can I speak to a doctor maybe? And she says, no, I haven't gotten a second opinion, but they say it's really, really doesn't look good. Rabbi, come on, don't, don't probably suffer. suffering. Can we just let him go so I can just, you know, not have to suffer through seeing him, you know, in this state. And, and I said, well, look, if you're looking for a Jewish law perspective, and I'm thinking in my head, for example, of this story in Yuma and these sources of the behem that we we um we tend to err on the side of prolonging life so i'm thinking well i don't know i mean if you were to extubate to to withdraw care in such a way that he would die instantaneously this is going to be a challenge in jewish law so i said you know i'm not sure that i can say that right now that i'm comfortable saying that let's see if you can get a second opinion maybe i can talk to a doctor we can we can research this a little bit but i don't know if right now i'm ready to say that if that's what you're looking for a rabbi to say so she says, oh, she's, I see she's disappointed in me. And I said, could you see if you can get a second opinion? Let's see how it goes for another day. Call me back tomorrow. The next day she calls me back. She says, Rabbi, it's, it's the same. No, no change. Uh, I think we should just let him go. And I said, so there was a second opinion also. She says, no, they, no, one, no one came, but I think it's just not, I think it's just the right thing to let him go. So I don't know. I just wasn't convinced. And I just, I felt uncomfortable, especially to put that on me to be able to take his life in my hands like that. So I said, look, I know it's Friday now. Let's give it the weekend. Make sure we ask them for another opinion over the weekend, get some more details, see how the trajectory is going, see how he's doing. And on Monday, call me back. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, oh, we'll have to figure out something, some way to make this work within Jewish law for her and for her son. Um, and let's see, let's see how he progresses a couple more days that I'll be more comfortable with. And the whole weekend I was thinking about it. Well, what am I going to say? I'm not sure because if he would die right away as a result. I don't know. I feel a little bit uncomfortable with it. Um, but Monday came and she didn't call me. Tuesday came. She didn't call me. I even started thinking, like, I wonder, I wonder why she never called me back. Um, and I didn't really know her well. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't think, I didn't reach out to her. I just thought she, if she needs, she'll call me. But I was thinking maybe I should call her. Then Wednesday, I didn't hear from her again. But I was in a, at an event Wednesday night, and a rabbi comes over to me and says, "Oh, you're the rabbi at the hospital there, aren't you?" I said, "Yeah." He says, "Oh, what a wild story that happened over there at that other hospital, no?" I said, "What? What wild story?" He said, "Yeah, with the kid, with the teenager, with the aneurysm." I said, what, how did you know about that? He says, oh, they didn't tell you, they didn't call you back. He says, yeah, you know, they called me over the weekend on Sunday and they said, you know, that Rabbi Weiner, he's too strict. He's not letting us um, just move on and let him go. So what do you think? Will you let, will you give me permission? 
So this rabbi says, you know what, I, I, I felt bad for her. And so I said, yes, it's okay. So she said, okay, thank you. And then she went and told them, but you know, the weekend things moved slower in the hospital. No one got around to it. Monday came and she had told them already, you know, extubate, let, let him go. But no one, no one got to it. No one came. Then Tuesday came and she, she was told they're coming today. It's going to happen today. But then she thought, you know, I don't know if I'm seeing things, but his numbers seem to be improving. And also I feel like he's responding a little bit when I, when I, um, when I try to like cause a reflex. So maybe we can wait till Wednesday, she says to them. They said, okay, we'll wait till Wednesday. Wednesday comes and he begins responding much more certainly. And in fact, they checked again. They said, you know what? He, he, it seems to be that the blood is residing. So by Wednesday afternoon, he had woken up. And that <clears throat> Wednesday night, they told me this. To make a long story short, to make a long story short, they, a month later, she comes to my office with her son walking, actually right here, where I'm sitting right now. She walks into my office with her son and she says, Rabbi, I want you to meet the patient whose life you saved. And my response was, I didn't, I didn't save his life. It was Jewish law. That's it. In this case, you know, I felt that it wasn't right, according to Jewish law, to rush into letting him go. And thank God that approach allowed time. And that's what he, all he needed in this case. He was a young man and he survived. And I thought to myself, wow, you know, sometimes we do have to give people that shot. And, 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 and sometimes people are resilient and they can recover. And we need to, you know, at least get a second opinion, give them some time, see, see how the process goes. And I thought, thought to myself, yeah, you know, this is part of this perspective that life is of infinite value, no matter what the state, we should do whatever we can to prolong life. However, there is another perspective. There is another perspective uh, that I want to share with you and try to balance the two. The other perspective is based on, and if you have the sources there, um, you know, the, the Torah says, we just read it not, not too long ago in Deuteronomy, and if you don't have the sources, it's okay. I'm just going to explain it to you. And I'll read you the line. The Torah says, Raki shamer lecha ushmar nafshecha. Watch yourself me'od. In fact, the only time the Torah uses the phrase me'od is when it comes to health. Shmar nafshecha me'od. Watch your health very much. Pentishkach et adavarim asher roi necha. Lest you forget the things that you've seen, meaning lest you forget the Torah. Now, it seems to be implying that verse, by the way. You should guard your life, guard your health. So that pen tishka, so that you don't forget. In other words, it's not saying guard your health just for the sake of being health, just for the sake of being alive. It's saying so that you can live a meaningful life. Guard your health so that you can engage in meaningful life activities. In fact, and I think this is one of the most important stories in the Talmud, and the one that I turn to very frequently in a hospital, is the story of the death of Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi. Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi was one of the greatest rabbis ever. Right, Rabbi Huda Anasi was the editor of the Mishnah, um, a really crucial figure in the history of Jewish law. Um, and he was a very important person, a lot of students. And the, the Talmud tells the story of his death. And it's fascinating because what happened was there was a woman who lived with him. She's called the Amsa Debe Rebbe. She was like his assistant, his, like his personal assistant. She was a very wise woman. She's quoted actually throughout the Talmud, sometimes translating words and teaching Jewish law. And, and she was inside the house with him. So she really knew what was happening. He also had students outside. So the story goes that as he's suffering and dying, um, not necessarily just in his deathbed, I mean, he was kept on getting up and going to the bathroom, it says. So obviously he could still move, but he was suffering horribly. Uh, his students are outside praying for him to recover. And <clears throat> also the woman who lived with him, Amsa the Rebbe, she was also praying for him to recover. But she saw that he was suffering and they didn't see because they were outside. And she realized, you know what? This is a life of suffering. We're praying to prolong his suffering here not to prolong his life, but to prolong his dying. And she said, this isn't in his best interest. And she realized, you know what? I need to change our prayers. And she began to pray for God to take him. But he stayed alive. And she realized, she looks out the window, she sees hundreds of students out there praying for him to live. She says, oh, their prayers are keeping him alive, even though I know life is no longer in his best interest. So she says, how am I going to stop them, though? So she has an idea. She goes to the roof, where they, which was behind where they were, she has a huge jug and she smashes the jug down to the ground and it makes a huge explosion sound. When the jug explodes, you know, obviously they become startled. And apparently the belief was that their prayers were literally his respirator. They were keeping him alive. God would not let him go as long as these students were praying for him to live. But when they stopped praying for a second in their fear, his soul left. And many of the rabbis of the Rishonim, a famous rabbi called the Ran, and the Aruch HaShulchan and, and Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, a number of the great rabbis throughout history have argued that the Talmud is telling the story because it's praising 
Dabsa de Bey Rebbe, this woman who had, who had the compassion to recognize that prolonging his life was no longer in his interest. That's why sometimes I say in the hospital, you know, my main line that I tell people is that we do everything we can to prolong life. Yes, like the first story. Life is a, almost like of infinite value. We do everything we can to prolong life. But we do not prolong the dying process. We do not prolong suffering. Once the medical professionals have determined that a person's actually in a dying process, we don't prolong that. We don't prolong the suffering. We can't even take into account quality of life considerations like this, like the Amsad the Bey Rebbe did for Rabbi Yehud Hanasi. And so I, I revised my perspective on the value of life. Whereas I used to agree with all those who would say life is of infinite value, I started saying, you know, I think it's of relative value, relative to pain and suffering. Life is of incredible value. Life is of, of priceless value, um, indescribable value. But I don't know if we can say it's infinite because there are some things, in other words, Pro, not dying a death of prolonged suffering, that is maybe more valuable even than life. We don't want to prolong that suffering. So, so for example, you know, many people think that we have this perspective. We have to do everything we can at all costs to keep someone alive. I, I, remember, I remember a very jarring story. Um, one, one time I got a call. There, there, was, a, there was a patient who, who was um, very frail and dying and um, we were having meetings with the family of the patient to try to explain that, you know, there's nothing else that could be done to prolong his life. Therefore, what we should do is make sure he just doesn't, he, his dying process is, is, as, is as comfortable as possible and that we shouldn't prolong the suffering. But he kept on saying, no, we have to do everything we can to prolong life. My rabbi says we can't, we can't stop life in any way. So we said, well, what about DNR? What if his heart would stop? Then do we have to resuscitate? And he called his rabbi. His rabbi said, yes, even then you must resuscitate. So that was their perspective. And, you know, we're trying to be respectful to their perspective and trying to explain things, but we were accommodating that. Then I get a call one day from the son of the patient saying, could you come up to my father's room right away? I, I need to talk to you right away. So I get up there and he says, Rabbi, I want to make sure that my father is no code. That's the status, should be no code. So no code means DNR. It's the same thing. So I thought something's wrong here because he's been fighting us and saying, no, DNR is against my religion, but I want no code. So I said, could you explain to me what, um, what you mean by that? Because I think there's a miscommunication happening. So he says, yeah, I'll explain. He says, we want to prolong my father's life. Yes, that's our value. But, you know, in the ICU, the rooms have glass doors. And he says, I was sitting in my father's room and all of a sudden I hear code blue being called out on the loudspeaker. So I look out of the hallway and I see the room right next door to my father's room. Another patient who I've been watching, this patient also looked very frail and weak. And all of a sudden I see nurses, doctors, residents, pharmacists running into the room, pounding on his chest, inserting lines, throwing bags and lining, hanging new bags, pumping, pumping, putting something in his mouth. There was blood splattering it was happening for 45 minutes for an hour. And then all of a sudden the next thing I heard was he has died. And I thought, whoa, that, that was a horrible death. And I, I just asked my nurse, how do I make sure that doesn't happen to my father? And she says, well, you, he should be no code then. He should be, we shouldn't resuscitate. We only resuscitate when there's a chance of resuscitation. So he says to me, I don't want that for my father. I said, but do you understand? This is what we've been saying the whole entire time here that we've been, we've been saying to you, but you've been fighting, you've been pushing against it. He says, oh, I didn't realize that's what it was. Now I realize. So, it, so I said, so, okay, then if you want to change it, then we can have a conversation about that. He says, well, let me call my rabbi and just make sure. He calls his rabbi and he, his rabbi says, no, no, we're against, we're against DNR. So I, so I hear him now explaining to the rabbi the thing I just said to him. hear him telling the whole story again. And his rabbi says, oh, oh, that's what DNR means? Oh, yeah, in that case, yes, absolutely. I thought, oh, it's just because sometimes people lack the nuance. They think, Oh, in all cases, no matter what, life is of infinite value, and, and they're not thinking. You're, you know, one other time, I'll tell you one more, and I'll just wrap up this section of what I was saying. I'll open up to responses, and I'll tell you maybe a few more stories. If we, um, we had a similar case. There was unfortunately a woman um, who was dying. She had lost a lot of weight. She was very frail, very weak. There was nothing else more that could be done for her. We had a family meeting, and um, as we went into the meeting, the son of the patient called his rabbi and said, "What? What's the? What should I tell them?" His rabbi was getting on a plane, had not seen the patient in person, and says, look, I'm getting on a plane. All I can tell you is our value is infinite life. Do everything always. So he says, okay. So he's in the meeting. He keeps on saying, no, we do everything. The doctor says, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, but um, it's not really a choice anymore because there's nothing that can be done for her. We just need to make sure she's comfortable. We cannot resuscitate her. She, we'll just break her bones in this case. She was so weak. So the son 
stood up over the doctor and he says, doctor, if my mother's heart stops beating, you will resuscitate her or I will grab your hands and I will force you to. So this doctor, uh, every, it was like, you could cut the tension with the knife in the room. And it was like, so, so, so tense and so tragic. Then the doctor stands up and he says, well, what a shame that you won't be here for your mother's final days. I'm going to call security now. And, and she, he walks out of the room. So then the son is like shaking. He, he's so upset. I remember I put my, sh my hand in his shoulder and he almost hit me. And I said, I said, I I'm so sorry. Maybe let, let's call your rabbi and, and describe the situation. Maybe it'd be different if he understood everything we just heard. He said, well, you're saying my rabbi's wrong? I said, no, nope, he's not wrong. But maybe he needed to hear this whole conversation, all the details. He says, fine, if you think so, call him. So I called him. I put on speaker, intentionally I wanted the son to hear it. I said, Rabbi, let me explain the whole situation to you. Do we have to do everything in this case? Or does, is, does the patient's you know, quality of life, can that be taken into account? Not to kill her, God forbid, but to allow her to allow natural death when the time comes. That's another, another way of saying DNR, but I think it's a better way of saying it. In other words, not that we're not doing anything, but we're allowing death to occur when it occurs naturally and ensuring that it happens in the most compassionate and pain-free manner. So the, ra the rabbi heard that whole story and he said, oh, that's the situation? Oh, absolutely, of course. And then the son said, oh, okay, please don't kick me out of the hospital, get the doctor back. And we got him back and it worked out. But I think the problem of these stories and why I'm sharing them is because when there's this knee jerk assumption that life is of infinite value and nothing else can be, can, can take precedence and we have to do everything at all costs, no matter what, it, it ends up causing more suffering. Now, we do want to try to prolong life. And that's why I told the story, the hopeful story at the beginning, because sometimes when we err on the side of life and err on the side of prolonging life, it's the right thing. And so we don't want to be too quick to just give up. But on the other hand, at the same time, we also want to recognize that, you know, everyone, all of us, you know, um, have limited number of days. So hopefully we can make the most of our days and everyone leaves this world at some point. And so we should spend time sometimes, it's difficult, but we also need to think about how to ensure that when we leave this world, it's in the most compassionate and pain-free manner. Um, and so that's why I use the phrase relative value. I think that the, the key value of life in Judaism is that it's of incredible, priceless, limitless value. But I would say relative, relative to sometimes pain and suffering, not that it's of infinite value. There's a lot more that I, I want to share and I want to talk about, but I, I said a lot. So I'd love to just hear if there are any reactions or, or comments or alternate perspectives. And if not, I'll share more or afterwards we'll share more, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, I have a question. Sure. So my question is with everything that you've described right now, Thank you, by the way, those are very interesting. How can the ultra-Orthodox communities in Israel and in the States uh, not pay attention to what potential there is in the, the COVID, if they contract COVID and many, many of their people are dying without them taking the responsibility and saying, well, we need to be in the synagogue and we need to yeah. do all these things together, uh, where does that come from? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question and, and a frustrating question. And I might not be the perfect person to answer because it's not my perspective. So I don't know if I would give the most generous answer. Um, definitely the rabbis that I look to, even some of them are in the ultra Orthodox community have not taken that perspective. The majority of rabbis that I've turned to have been extremely cautious. In fact, one of them just today um, came out with a letter repeating what he said at the beginning in March that not only should we be following all government guidelines in terms of health and safety precautions, but we actually, as uh, Jews, should be even more strict about maintain, being careful about um, these precautions. So that's the perspective that I take. I mean, I know that some people either, you know, I think there's, there's cultural or um, sociological, um, uh, you know, issues that are causing people to take a different perspective. And so it's, it's very hard to um, determine what that is, but I, I, it's not the approach that I take. Let's put it that way. I share your frustration. Rabbi, um, I, I had a question myself, um, maybe jumping off a little bit on the COVID question, because I think being a chaplain these days, 
I imagine might be so much more complicated as you know, the cases that you shared with us were cases where relatives could be close by at the hospital bed, right? And now we are in a situation where relatives need to make a decision about things of, of you know keeping in you know keeping life support or not um where they cannot be close to yeah. their dear one how has the pandemic affected your role here as a chaplain and and this decision making what would you yeah, say yeah you're so right because part of the point of what, of my story is part of what I was trying to share is that you know it's one thing to have a principle and just kind of like a general guideline, but it's very different when you're on the ground, you know, in person, you're seeing people suffering or you're seeing, you know, people before you and like kind of looking at what it what it looks like versus what you just hear in secondhand report. And one of the big problems we had, I mean, the the lack, the the lack of visitor permission, the 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 prohibition against visitors in the hospital has been one of the most difficult aspects of the pandemic, um, especially with end of life decision making, because what you end up having is um, you know, there's always some second guessing of, um, of the medical team. I mean, people often do that, you know, when they, they get told something and, and they often, you know, um, question them and, and that's people's right. They're allowed to ask questions. And, uh, but it's one thing when you're in the room and you're watching the patient, you're watching the whole trajectory of what's happening, but it's a totally different thing when you're just getting updates from the doctor every couple of days and they're making decisions and you can't even see what's happening. So what we've been doing is we've been trying to, um, bring in um, iPhones and iPads. Um, as chaplains, we've been saying, you know, let it, we know that the doctors and nurses are very busy. So let us supplement by going ourselves and, and creating visits, at least virtually, so that the people can see both, they can see their loved one, see them in person, they can have someone holding up an iPad or an iPhone during rounds, so they can actually hear the discussion from the doctors. Um, um, we're advocating as frequently as possible to try to get people in. Sometimes we get permission, you know, 15 minutes or an hour, one person or taking turns. We're trying to allow as much as possible to get family members when it's really critical um, to get updates and to be brought into the hospital. I mean, it, it is a big challenge to be able to make these decisions from afar. Excellent point. Thank you. Well, if there's an, another question on this topic, I would encourage, you know, uh, to ask it now, or if not, I would invite you. You said you had um, more more to topics to share with us. And let's see if there's something else coming up. Rabbi Weiner, I have a question. Um, I work in an emergency room here in Phoenix, and we also have a very active, uh, fairly active palliative care program in the hospital. Uh, and I wish they, <clears throat> we had uh, greater pres presence for the palliative care team in the emergency department, where we all too often see patients who, in fact, either end or are end of life or maybe approaching end of life, <clears throat> where very little discussion was had regarding goals of care. I'm curious how much you participate with the palliative care team at Cedar sinai and um, how that works uh, at that facility. Yeah, I mean, great question. We feel that it's essential to have chaplaincy embedded with palliative care. So we have a chaplain that's full-time embedded with the palliative care team, because really what palliative care is all about, you know, palliative care, for those who don't know, is really, um, you know, symptom management and ensuring that people are not um, physically suffering um, when they're going through whatever treatment they're going through. And, and it's not just about physical suffering, it's about um, it, it's about, you know, the whole person. It, actually, um, I often distinguish between pain and suffering. So pain refers to physical pain. Suffering refers to emotional, existential. And, and you know, we talk about in Judaism, you know, when we say the Mishra Berach, refuat nefesh and refuat haguf, both, right? I see a lot of shaking hands with that, right? So, of course, we care about refuat haguf, healing the body, but it comes right there with healing the soul and healing the whole person, whatever that might be. Um, and in fact, healing is the right word because you know there's a difference also between curing and healing. So sometimes someone can't be cured, but they can still heal. Like I'll, I'll tell you another story since we're sharing stories today. Um, I, I remember once this was one of the most moving uh, experiences that I, I've had in my chaplaincy in 15 years. Um, 
which was that uh, I got involved with a patient who was on a palliative care service who was um, dying uh, from cancer, horrible cancer in her 30s. It was a very sad case. And, um, and she was very depressed. That, that was what we were told when we were called. The chaplains were being called because she was extremely depressed. And what we were told was, you know, we've tried everything, depression medications and all the different interventions. And, and she remains very depressed. Um, you know, all the depression medications did was, you know, side effects. So we got involved. Uh, I met her um, and we started to just get to know her as chaplains. You know, that's our role is to try to just meet people where they are. You know, as we say in Hebrew, basher husham, wherever they are, whatever they're experiencing, trying to understand who they are and what, what matters to them and uh, what they're all about and what their concerns are and, and just listen. And, and as we listened to her, we, we realized that her main concern was um, her daughter. She had a small daughter and she realized her, my daughter's never going to know her mother. And that was, that was um, weighing on her um, horribly. That was, that was the worst thing to her. Worse than dying was that her daughter would grow up not knowing who her mother was. Um, and we started talking about, well, has anything been done, you know, to try to help her daughter know who her mother is? And she said, well, what, no, what can be done? So we, we came up with two ideas. We, we made an ethical will. Um, an ethical will is actually an ancient Jewish tradition. Um, Yaakov, Jacob does it in the Bible. David does it before he dies for Solomon. Um, we, uh, Nachmanides wrote a famous ethical will, the Baal Shem Tov. It's been, uh, Yehuda Chassid. Uh, it's been a famous Jewish tradition, which is that uh, before a person dies, they create a document which describes all of their, their values, what the lessons they've learned in life, um, traditions that are important to them, uh, what matters to them, their legacy, what they want their legacy to be, um, who they were, what makes them tick. And um, they create this as a gift, basically, for their loved, for their, as a legacy, for their loved ones, to live on after their legacy. Um, and, and the truth is, it ends up being a gift also for them, for themselves, not just for their loved ones, just for the process of writing this. You know, people, it doesn't mean someone's dying when they write an advanced, when, when they write an ethical will, it just means they're thinking about, you know, their legacy. And so um, we did that for her. She, she did it. She created her. And then we also uh, made a video where she uh, made some messages for her daughter. So her daughter would be able to see what she was all about and her, her dreams and her hopes for her daughter. And um, incredibly, her depression symptoms began to lift. Not, not that she became happy, go lucky, everything was fine. I mean, she was in a horrible situation, but she began to eat and drink again. She began to sleep normal hours. She began to participate in her care. She began to, you know, function and express, you know, um, appreciation that, that for how things were developing. And, and it was incredible just to watch it, that it was just, um, you know, it, it, there was no medical intervention that could deal with that emotional existential suffering. It was a spiritual, uh, um, philosophical, ethical intervention, and it had a massive impact. Um, and unfortunately, she died not too long after that, but it felt like, what a gift. You know, I haven't been in touch with uh, her family. I'd love to know. I mean, hopefully her daughter has, she's probably 10, 10, 15 years old now. She, hopefully she has, you know, had a chance to see these documents and it's had, a, had an impact in her life. But that's an example. You, you had asked Dr. Mulk about, um, you know, chaplains in palliative care. That, that, that's what it's about. It's the refua to nefesh part. Whereas the doctors are for a goof, and it has to be a, a, a team, a team, you know, that, that's Ju that's Judaism. I mean, I forgot who it was. Right, I'm looking around the board. Um, maybe uh, someone. I'm, I'm sorry, because the board, my board just shift, shifted. But someone who had asked about the situation in in the ultra orthodox community with COVID. I mean, the the way it's supposed to work in Judaism is a partnership with the medical establishment, with the doctors, with public health officials, and with the rabbis together, not fighting with each other, not working against each other, um, collaboratively. Any other um, thoughts or questions, or I'm happy to share other other issues that we face. Hi, this is AJ from uh, BBM. I think Hi. Rabbi Stein Koken's computer is just going down a little bit, so hopefully we'll hear back from her in a second. But I guess I have a question, sure. which is really about how do you navigate when people have differing, I don't know, ideological views from what you think is the best course of care. Like if someone is just really against some certain course of treatment and you're like, no, this has to be the way because this is the most effective based on, you know, ba ba uh, past evidence or whatever. So how do you navigate, you know, tricky terrain in that way? Yeah, that's an excellent question. One of the most common issues. I mean, th and there's a lot of ways of approaching that. I mean, one of the most, most troubling, and I'm not, I'm not sure if this is what you're asking, but one of the most challenging questions, you know, so, so for me, myself, let's say, 
you know, with my own commitments as an Orthodox Jew. But I, I work with all kinds of people, right? Every kind of person you can imagine. And my job is not to impose my values or my perspective on them in any way whatsoever. It's there, it's there to be there for them, to listen to them, to support them, um, to be a resource if that's what they want, but not to impose that. Um, so, you know, frequently people will make decisions that um, might not, I, I might not be able to support that decision halakhically, meaning it might go against a certain position that if you would ask me what's the ideal, I might not agree with. But um, there's a lot to say about that, but I, I'll share with you based on our experience um, with, um, with physician aid in dying. I, I don't know if it's legal in Arizona, it's legal in California, um, it's not legal there. So. Um, medical aid in dying, or otherwise, sometimes some people call it physician-assisted suicide. There's different names for it, um, usually based on your perspective about it is which name you call it, actually. Um, so it's legal in California. It's been legal here for a few years. Um, and it was a big challenge at first, especially, I, um, you know, because of my own perspective, my own Jewish perspective in terms of if it's, if it's the right thing or not, and then also wanting to be there to support patients. So I did a lot of research, especially out of Oregon, which is the first state that legalized physician aid and dying. And there's fascinating research. For example, uh, there's a lot to say, and I'm not gonna go into all of it right now, but just, just an example of an amazing study that was done. Um, I quote it in my book. I'm happy to send it out to anyone if anyone's interested in this. But um, a study was done on patients who requested physician aid in dying. Um, you know, in, in, in Oregon in particular, they have all kinds of surveys that they fill out and that's because they keep lots of data. And so they were able to find out which patients identified as being religious, not religious, who had a clergy involved and this, the approach their clergy took even. And they were able to, now, one of the things with, with physician aid and dying is that it has to be self-ingested, right? The patient receives a prescription from their doctor, but then they have to take the medication that ends their life. Um, so we know that a very significant percentage, maybe even a majority of those who receive the prescription don't actually ingest it and don't end up dying. And, and that's because the, the research in Oregon, this is a side point, but they, they found that the number one reason people do this is because they want not because they're depressed, not because they're not because they're in pain. It's because they want um, control. They want a sense of control of their dying process when they're so when they're so vulnerable and so much at um, at the whim of other people. They want to be able to have some control in the process. So that's the number one reason people do this. Anyways, many people don't do it though. They get the prescription, but then they don't actually take the the medication. So they're trying to analyze an organ and trying to understand why do some people do it and why do don't others? You know what 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 influences if they will actually take it or not? And um, they found something fascinating that of those who um, um, self-identified as being religious, those who said that their clergy were judgmental and non-supportive of their decision were more likely to take it than those who described their clergy as being compassionate and supportive of their decision, which is really fascinating and somewhat contra and counterintuitive basically because you would think look if i'm against this i should tell them i'm against it and i should try to encourage convince them not to do it and research found that actually if you don't want them to do it you're better off just being compassionate and just hearing them out letting them have someone to have a shoulder to cry on and someone to talk to and listen to them compassionately non-judgmentally um and the truth is we find this in halacha also so in jewish law the area that this comes into is what's called um, you cannot put a stumbling block before the blind. So I can't do something. So me as a rabbi, let's say, I, I think I have a nuanced approach to this issue, but let's just say for argument's sake that I'm strongly opposed to physician aid and dying. And mostly I'm opposed to it, but let's just say I'm strongly opposed to it. Um, and, and, I ha and then for me to therefore help a patient in any way gain access to a doctor or the medications who will that, to do this, it would be in the category of leaf the ever, of putting a stumbling block before the blind because I'm helping someone do what I consider to be a sin. That would be the halakhic category. However, there's caveats to that category. One caveat is called tre avre de nahara, two sides of a river, which means that if someone can access something on their own, then for me to just give it to them is not prohibited. Only if there's two sides of a river, river. And let's say I'm on the other side of the river and I have the object that they want, the prohibited object. And now I, and they can't get it because it's other side of the river, but I bring it across the river, which they could not have done on their own. Then I violate this prohibition. 
But if they could have done it anyways without me, then it becomes a different issue of Messiah. And the issue of Messiah in Jewish law of assisting, of aiding and abetting is very nuanced. So for example, if someone's going to do something prohibited and I can help them do it, but do it in a less bad way, that could be a good thing actually. So I'll give you some examples. Um, Rav Moshe Feinstein was asked the following question. There was a, there was a, um, a hall in um, London, a kosher catering hall, dancing hall, that um, was open for rent, for being rented out. Uh, remember back in the days when they used to be able to like, go to events in, in public, at, at like halls, and then people would dance and have food and there'd be buffets. There used to be such a thing. People would gather and, and eat. Yeah, so um, and God willing, we'll be once again one day. So anyways, this hall rented them, rented out their, the hall for one night, and they didn't know what it was for. Just some group came and rented the hall. And then there's flyers around town. The rabbis who are head, head in charge of the hall see that, oh, it's for some kind of disco or something that they don't approve of. And they're thinking, oh, Eve, we rented our hall, our kosher hall, to an event. It's a Jewish event, but it, an event that we don't think is kosher, in our opinion. What do we do? So they called Ramosha Feinstein. What should we do? Should we cancel this event? Should we fight it? He said, well, what are they going to do if you cancel it? And they said, well, they'll do it somewhere else. And he said, and will that be at a kosher hall? And they said, no, obviously not. They'll do it at some non-kosher hall. So he said, so at least if they do it at your hall, they'll at least serve kosher food at their event. So he said, so by stop, by protesting them, you're going to do nothing good. You're only going to end up hurting your cause. So sometimes we can actually be involved with something where we can help it happen better. And I'll give you another example. This is just another common case that I get ca called for. You know, I'm called for, let, let's say, let's say um, I'm called for um, um, a terminal extubation. The case that I opened up with, uh, a patient is on a ventilator. They're going to be removed, extubated, and they're going to die right away as a result. So let's say in some cases, Jewish law would say that that is problematic in certain cases. Um, but, but they call me as the rabbi, and they, this is the frequently the call that I get. Rabbi, what time are you available? Because we're going to let the respiratory therapist know to come right after. Whenever you come, they're going to do it right after you come. So in other words, we're waiting for you. And once you arrive, then the patient will die because we're timing it based on your, your schedule. In other words, you're responsible for their life and death. That's how it feels, at least, right? And it feels problematic to me. It's like, oh, boy, maybe I shouldn't be going. Or maybe I should take my time and, like, stop and get lunch first and then Starbucks and then uh, take a few. Like, should I be trying to prolong their life? Like, so um, the answer that I received from great, great um, rabbinic thinkers was, you know, your job there is to provide support, not to tell them what's right or wrong. You should be there. You should go right away. And actually, by being there, maybe you'll, you'll be able to help them do things in a slightly better way. For example, all the time this happens. I'll tell you the following scenario that happens monthly at least. So I'm with them, we say some prayers, and then they say to me something along the lines of, Rabbi, um, do you know which Jewish mortuaries um, do cre cremation? Or what's the cheapest cremation service in town? Or Rabbi, do you have the number for, the, for cremation? Something along those lines. So what am I supposed to say? So um, definitely I can't say as a rabbi, I'm not gonna say to them like, you know, I think that's horrible and you shouldn't do it as a chaplain, but I'm also not going to say like, oh, I think that's great. So oftentimes what I'll say is something along the lines of, um, oh, oh, tell me about why, why you made that decision. Without being judgmental, sometimes, actually the majority of the time they say, well, that's just cheaper. And so we want to just go the cheaper route. It's just easier. So then I can gently say, um, well, actually there is a program here in LA that if you would, I could have you call them. They actually provide, um, um, very low cost Jewish burial that's even cheaper than cremation. If you want, I can give you their number. You don't have to, but, and, and very frequently they'll say, oh, I didn't know that. Sure, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. So then they call the end of having a traditional burial. So I sometimes ask my rabbinic colleagues who criticize me for going to the bedside of terminal extubations if they think that that's against Jewish law. And I say, you know, if I wouldn't have gone, what would they have done? They still would have excavated the patient. The patient still would have died as a result, but instead the patient would have been, ex would have been cremated. And since I went, all that changed was we said some beautiful prayers, we provided comfort for the family, and we, instead of cremating, had traditional burial, if that's what they want, if that, you know. So I think you end up, you end up gaining more than you lose from that. So, um, so I know that was a very long answer to your question, but my perspective is, you know, sometimes people want things that, um, that might go against my values, but I feel like my job is to show compassion to listen, to be there for them, and maybe even sometimes that can lead to better outcomes than you would have expected. Any other comments or questions or?
reactions? Or maybe I answered the wrong question and you want to give me the right question? No, that was great. Yeah, does anyone else have any other questions? We still have about 10 minutes left. Um, Rabbi Weiner, I, I am sorry, this is Rabbi Stein Kokin. I also seem to have some um, tech problems. Now my camera is not working. <laughs> um, I had another question. Um, when I was thinking about this talk, I was thinking more, um, more about, again, about the pandemic. And I was wondering if you see how halakha, Jewish law, responds to things that come upon now that you come up with the pandemic. If, if you have seen some interesting developments or interesting cases. Yeah, definitely. There's a lot. Um, I'll give you a couple examples. There's so much that the, that the halakha has helped us with the pandemic. Um, um, one example was, is with triage, with emergency triage. You know, we had to figure out both at the beginning, when there was a concern about ventilators, and still some places there are, if there would be enough ventilators, and now the discussions about you know how to triage the vaccine when there's when there's insufficient um, dosages once it's available, how do you decide who to provide it for? So there, there's a basic approach um, to that question that's based on a, such a fascinating case that you know who would have thought it would be so relevant, but the case was as follows. It's, it's known in philosophy as the trolley problem, but a real case happened in Bnei Brak in Israel um, like 80 years ago where a person was driving down a hill um, and his tr in his truck and his brakes went out and he realizes as he's going down, he's pumping his brakes, nothing's happening. And he's, he's going you know, 60 miles an hour now and there's a car stopped at a red light in front of him and he sees it's full of people. And he thinks, oh my gosh, I'm gonna slam into that car and we're all gonna die. And he realizes he only has one way he can turn the car. He's about to swerve the car. He sees one pedestrian standing right there. And he has a split second to make the decision. I either just do nothing passively, smash into the car, many people die. Or I turn the car and then I actively kill that innocent pedestrian. So he asked um, a great rabbi, the Chazunish. The Chazunish said, it's comparable. There is a story in the Talmud actually about this, where someone shoots an arrow and I don't know how they did this, but apparently they were very good, you know, um, um, at, at, at shooting arrows. And there was a way you could shoot an arrow that was going to kill a whole group of people. And there was a person standing near in between them and the arrow with a, like a shield. And they could just get the shield up enough that it would deflect the arrow. But it was going to deflect the arrow in a way that would kill one person. So it's the same question, because on the one hand, we have a principle in Jewish law, Sheva Altase. It's better to do nothing, passive. It's better to do nothing than to actively kill someone. Um, and also we have the principles of, you know, um, who says whose blood is redder, that's in the Talmud, and you cannot give one life for another life, and dochi nefesh, you nefesh, can't kill one person for another person, so, um, but the Chazani said, no, diverting that arrow is not killing the one person, it's saving the many people, and the rule in triage, he writes, is always saving the most people possible, so that led to a whole perspective in triage of how do we maximize benefit. So that might mean, for example, sometimes some, sometimes the very sickest people who would take the most intensive resources might have to take second priority to the people that, um, let's say in a real urgent pandemic, who can be treated faster, but who urgently need the care. Um, or, or figuring out how to, how to um, provide a vaccine in a way that it, that it helps the most people possible. And then in regard, related to that, there is, the Talmud discusses um, what to do if um, a Kohen Gadol is dying, the great Kohen, and the Kohen Meshulach Melchama, the Kohen that would lead the people in battle and inspire them. And it says, you save the life of the Kohen Meshulach Melchama. Why? The commentaries say, because Rabim Srichim Lo, the masses need that person. So there, you see there's a value, sometimes you can try to determine even though we never give priority to one person over another, every person, every human life is of equal value, but sometimes you can try to um, figure out what's, what are the communal needs? What are the, what are the societal needs? You can take population health into account. And so these are just some examples of how we're trying to provide, um, apply ancient text to some modern questions that have come up during the pandemic. Well, thank you. Thank you. This is very insightful. Are there any, we, I think we might have an, time for one or two questions. 
Rabbi? Yes. Yeah, hi, I'm Steve Nathan. On the first story about the, the rubble. Yeah. The, the earthquake, whatever it was. I remember I, I attended uh, several years ago, they had a Jewish medical ethics conference in San Francisco. Yes, I remember those. They were really, they were really good. I remember, I forget who the doctor was, uh, it was a long time ago, but he was telling a story about, I think it came from Shulkin and Aru, that, that when you, on Shabbat, you're a doctor, and a patient, and, a, and, a, and, a, and your next door neighbor who's Jewish gets, needs to be seen, taken care of, you take care of her. You take care of the lady across the street that isn't Jewish. And the answer was just corollary to what you were saying earlier, that yes, and it was, it, it was the reason for it was more because you were part of the community. And so we're, and like, and like you said, every life is, is precious, whether they're Jewish or they're not. So we have an obligation as a physician to, 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 to treat, to, to break Shabbat, you know, Kippur, whatever, to, to save a life, to help somebody. Yeah. Was, and the, other, the other thing, though, the, the DNR, there's a lot, there's always a lot of confusion. With what I've usually tell patients that DNR doesn't mean do not treat. I said, when yes. you're a DNR, it means we're not, if, if, if your heart stops, we're not going to try to resuscitate and, and do chest compressions and all this, this kind of stuff. But we're going to treat you otherwise the same way we treat anybody else who wasn't. And then there was also a confusion in DNR. I don't know in your hospital if you have a DNR, DNI. Right, yes. Because I've, I've had this conversation with our palliative care team before. That that's confusing. And there was an article in Chest, I think, in July that, that, that looked at comparing some problems with about 26% of people didn't understand that, that they could be into be like if somebody has pneumonia, we need to put you on a ventilator, it'd be all like a COVID patient, maybe that and we, 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 we think we can get you off the ventilator, but we need to put the, and you can be still be a DNR, but you, you don't have to be a DNR, you don't have to be a DNI, you can be, you know, because there are situations where elective intubation uh, might be necessary, right? So, yes. I don't know if you have, have that. For you. So you, you do you have that in, in your hospital? Yeah, in, in certain cases, yes, absolutely. Thank you. I really yeah, yeah. Thank that. you. Thanks for your comments. Yes, um, Jean. Do we have DNI in Arizona? Because when I was working, I don't remember seeing anything like that. DNR, yes. I, I've never heard of do not intubate. Yes, I see Dr. Kaplan nodding her head. <laughs> what? Yeah, we in, uh, do not resuscitate, do not intubate, and we're moving towards language away from that to A and D, allow natural okay. death. Yeah. Oh. oh, that's a good, that's good. Yes. Well, well, <laughs> allow natural de death without suffering, because there could be asking for air, and then what do you do? Absolutely. Always comfort is provided. Always. No suffering. Right. So would that comfort be something like morphine or, you know, just yes. a face mask or whatever? Yes. Okay. And, and where are you? Where are you talking from? St. Joseph's. In Phoenix? Yes. Rabbi, uh, this is Barbara in Phoenix. Um, I have a question about Gosace. That was a, a concept that was brought up when my father was dying in terms of how to address end of life decisions. I'm really not sure where the Gosace comes from, where the writing or the literature is, but um, I know we found it very comforting to have that discussion to be able to make more Jewishly informed decisions. Yeah, yeah, Gosis is a helpful concept. That's referring to a patient who's in the dying process. Yeah. And um, you know, that's the one where, where the, the code of Jewish law, the Shulchan Aruch says that, let's say someone is in the dying process and somehow that, you know, we would never hasten their death. We would never do something to actively try to make them die faster. But um, if there's an external cause that's kind of prolonging the dying, the example the Talmud, the Shulchan Aruch gives is, you know, there, there's a, a noise, a wood chopper chopping a tree, and somehow, you know, the rhythm or the noise is keeping the person alive. Um, it says you actually should, and some say you would be obligated to actually just stop that wood chopping to allow the person to die comfortably. Again, you, you wouldn't kill the person, you know, you wouldn't stuff the pillow on the person's face, 
You want to make sure they're comfortable, but you can allow natural death. That is exactly what that is. And that's where a person needs to go say stuff. But the Shulchan Aruch says clearly that we, um, we, we allow that dying, natural death to occur. We right. remove, you know, we can remove, we, with the, the wording the rabbi says, we can remove an impediment. We remove the impediment to their dying. We just don't actually kill them. You know, we wouldn't actually hasten their death, but we can remove an impediment. Hasarat <laughs>